our distance, we will be glad to pick them up and bring them to church. Amen? Amen. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. We are in a sermon series entitled he- uh, Heroes of the Faith. And we're going to read one verse this morning. Verse 30. Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 30. I'm reading from the New International Version. Simple, short verse says this. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the people had marched around them for seven days. And by faith, the prostitute Rahab, what's her name? Rahab, Rahab, because she welcomed the spies. King James says, because she was kind to the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Father, I thank you for your word this morning. It is truth, it is light, it is life. And I pray this morning that your word would just saturate into us, to our very soul. Transform us, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I heard the story this week that I thought was so fitting that I would share it with you This morning, there was a man who was working in a factory. And one day, he came out of the factory. He was going through the entrance, and there's a security guard there, and he had a red wagon with him with a little box and wagon. You weren't supposed to bring anything out of the factory. So the security guard stops him and says, Excuse me, uh, what's in that box? He said, It's just sawdust. You know, from where they're doing the shavings, I sweep it up and I save it. I'm taking it home. I usually throw it away. He says, I don't believe you. Let me see the box. So he opened up the box and looked inside and he said, oh, this is sawdust. I should have got a box I could open. (laughs) Gonna ruin this illustration. Oh, there is sawdust in here. Okay. And he looked at the sawdust and he said, okay, you can go. So the guy leaves, right? He goes out. The next day, the guy is coming out of work, and again, he's pulling a red wagon and a little black box in it. Security guard stops him and says, what's in the black box? He said, sawdust. He said, sawdust, I don't believe you. Open it up, open it up. Sawdust, sticks his fingers in there. It's just sawdust, okay, you can go. This happens the next day, and the next day, and the next day, And then after five days, the security guard stops the guy again and says, listen, he says, I know you're doing something wrong. And I know you're stealing something. I don't know what it is. But let me see that box. And he opened it up. He took the box and he dumped it out into the wagon. There was nothing in it. The security guard was convinced he was doing something wrong. He said, look, I know you're stealing something. He says, I'll make a deal with you. If you'll just tell me what you're stealing, I promise you I will not report you. I need to know what's going on. The guy said, okay, I'll tell you. I'm stealing red wagons. (laughs) (laughs) And we laugh at that. But here's the truth, right? It's like we get so distracted by the little things that... We forget the big picture that's going right in front of us. Can I get a witness? You understand what I'm saying? And my concern, one of my concerns, I have a lot of concerns for you. (laughs) One of my concerns for you as a pastor is when I look around and see what's going on in our world, and I see what's going on in our country, and I see what's going on with the election, and I see your post on Facebook, and I see the stuff that people are saying, and I and I want to make sure this morning that you are not distracted by the little things. How many of you know it's the little foxes that spoil the vine? It's the little grain of sand in our shoe that keeps us from doing that walk. It's the little things that the devil uses to distract us while he is taking the wagon out. And so this morning as we look at Rahab, I want us to make sure that we get the big 
picture. So today we're going to talk about what's really important. And one of those things that is a theme in this story of Rahab is risks. So today we're going to talk about Rahab, a faith that risks. And I'm going to challenge you this morning and those of you watching online to take some risks for Jesus today. So turn to your neighbor and say, get ready to take a risk. Get ready to take a risk. We're talking about risk. You know, we take risks all the time, whether we know it or not. Every time you get in a car, you are taking a risk. When I get in a car, my wife's driving, it's double the risk. <laughs> Just saying. Walking down the street is a risk. This week, so tragically, a 76-year-old woman was walking down the sidewalk in Jewett City and a car loses control and kills her. Eating at a restaurant is a risk. You don't know what's in that food. Especially a risk if you go to McDonald's or Burger King or any other fast food joint. Flying in an airplane is a risk. Driving over a bridge. So if you drive over the, uh, uh, the bridge, <laughs> I forgot the name of the bridge. You drive over a bridge every single day to go to work, just trusting that that bridge is going to hold up over that, over that water. Working under a car is a risk. And we take risk every day in the natural realm. And listen, if we're able to take risk in the natural realm, we also need to learn to take risk in the spiritual realm. And as we're preaching about faith, you've got to understand that faith is all about taking risks. It's the very nature of faith. The definition of faith in Hebrews 11.1 1 is faith is a substance of things what? Hope for the evidence of things not seen. I don't know. I can't see it. I can't. I, it's a risk involved. It's Peter stepping out of the boat in faith, just trusting that that water is going to hold him. It's Daniel being lowered into the lion's den, not knowing whether he's going to be devoured or not, but knowing that God has got his back. It's faith is a risk. If there's no risk, there's no faith. Think about it. If you've got the money in your bank, in the bank and you give and you say, well, I, I can afford to give this and you give, you're not taking a risk because you've got it, right? If you go, uh, if you have a cold and you go take medicine and put it in your body, uh, you're not taking a risk. Of whether you, you are putting your trust in something that you know that's going to help you. Walking by faith requires risk risk. So let's look at this woman Rahab because do we really see anything in the test that suggests that she took a risk? Who's Rahab anyway? Some, some of you have never heard of this person Rahab. You've heard of Moses. You've heard of the other people we've preached about in Hebrews 11. You've heard their stories, but you've never heard of Rahab. Who is Rahab? There are three words, three H words that I use to describe Rahab, number one, is she was a harlot, a heathen, excuse me. She was a heathen. She was a heathen. What do you mean she was a heathen? People, people joke at me all the time because I call people heathens. <laughs> I may have called you a heathen. I may not have. but uh, You know, a heathen is somebody who is, doesn't know God, doesn't know anything about God, is not saved, is, is, is a worldly person, uh, no interest in the things of God, uh, a, a worshiper of false gods, anything other than the one and only true God. They're a heathen. She was a heathen. She was born and raised as a Canaanite in the city of Jericho and worshiped false gods all of her life. Until the Israelites got there, she had never heard of God Almighty. She was a heathen. Secondly, she was a harlot. We use the word prostitute. A woman of the night, a woman in red. Whatever euphemism you want to use, that's who she was. And some scholars take the text in Hebrew that is used to describe her as a prostitute. And they say that that Hebrew word could also be used as innkeeper. In other words, she's somebody who ran a motel and maybe she wasn't really a prostitute. But I looked at that Hebrew word and every usage of that word in the Old Testament is connected with prostitution 
And not only that, but in the New Testament, when she's referred to in our text in Hebrew 11, the Greek word is very specific right here. She was a harlot. She was a prostitute. She sold her body. And, and, and I know you think that's a, a horrible thing, and, and, and of course it, it is. But remember that in this day, prostitution has been going on since Genesis, right? And she made her living, and this was acceptable form of employment. It wasn't against the law back then. She run what we would call a cat house, right? And people would lodge there, and she'd provide services for them. That's all I'll say about that, okay? She was a harlot. But not only was she a heathen, not only was she a harlot, but I want you to notice that she was a hall of famer. What do you mean she was? She is in the faith hall of fame. Look at this. What did she do that put her in the faith hall of fame? In Hebrews chapter 11. Because here you have, the answer is, she was kind to some Hebrew spies. She was kind to some Hebrew spies. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait. This does not sound equitable. Here we have Noah whose faith built an ark. We have Abraham whose faith uh, takes him from his people and his land to a foreign place. He didn't even know where he was going. Here we have Moses who by faith performs all these miracles. Here we have, we just talked about Joshua who by faith brings the walls of Jericho down. And then you have Rahab who was kind to some spies. How does she get in there? What is, what, what, is, what is that that makes her so special and unique that she was kind? Well, I'm kind to people, but I'm not in the faith hall of fame. And how does she get in there? And the answer is, there's more to the story. As Paul Harvey used to say, and now the rest of the story. So we're going to turn and read Rahab's story. And that is found back in Joshua. Uh, But before we go to Joshua, I want to say something about this word kindness and this text here. Are you with me still? So I want to say something about kindness. When I was sharing with you the 10-year vision for the church, one of the things I said that God put in my heart was that Lighthouse Church would be a church that cultivates a climate, an atmosphere of kindness. That this would be a place where people come and experience the love of God through our kindness, through our words, through our gestures, through our acceptance, through our affirmation of their life. That we would develop that. And I think it's interesting in the text that it doesn't mention in Hebrews anything about Rahab believing in God. It says that she was kind to the spies. And what I want to point out is that her kindness was a manifestation of her faith in Yahweh. Her kindness was proof that she believed in their God over her gods. This was one of the manifestations that God was working in her life was that she treated them with kindness. Our faith in God, yours and mine, is also demonstrated in the way that we treat other people. It's a good place to say, wait for the amen. 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 All right. You cannot say, John the Apostle said this, the first time I said, you cannot say you love God and hate your brother. How we treat people is directly correlated to our relationship with our God. The more you love God, I'm teaching now, the more you love people. What I'm saying is, if somebody is foul-mouthed, if somebody is rude, if somebody is obnoxious, if somebody is putting you down and tearing you down, if somebody is pulling down instead of building up, that shows they don't really have a true relationship with God. 
I don't care how much they speak in tongues. I don't care how much they give in the offering plate or how often they go to church. If you don't treat your brother and sister with kindness and love, you ain't got no Jesus in you. Yeah, I feel the critical spirit coming back at me now this morning. Like, how can you say that? Because Jesus said it. A tree is known by its fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. Some of you think, well, it's okay that if I say this, you know, I just had my moment. No, it's not okay. It's not okay. This is manifested in us today, not only in the way we treat others, but also, can I say this, in our social media posts. Can I say this in our tweets? Can I say this in the things we speak or write on the internet? You know, I have a love-hate relationship with Facebook. My age, I do Facebook, right? It's an old people's thing now. But I have all these friends I connected with all over the country, you know, from college and all that stuff. And, we, and I see their families and what's going on with my family. And I love that part about, about but you know what I hate about Facebook? You. <laughs> I'm just being honest. It's the post I see from some of my church people on there. And I'm thinking, please don't like Lighthouse Church on your page. Please don't. Because what you just said, what you just wrote, that beam that you just put up there does not represent the kingdom of God. Does not represent Lighthouse Church. And I'm the pastor of Lighthouse Church. Does not represent me. So I want to, uh, I want to ask you to do a few things for me this morning. First of all, let me tell you why I'm, why I'm dealing with this kindness thing. I debated on whether to tell you this, but I'm just going to say it. Because, you know, I, there's, there may be guests or visitors here, and I, I don't want to say anything that would discourage you from coming to probably the greatest church in eastern Connecticut. But recently, in the last three months, we had two families that were new to our church. One had been coming about a year or so. One had been coming about six to eight weeks. And <clears throat> I developed a relationship with both these families, and both of them stopped coming to Lighthouse Church. And I went after them. Haven't seen you in church. What's going on? Both of them responded the same thing. They both said to me, well, uh, we decided that Lighthouse is not the place that we want to worship. And I said, why? Can you tell me why? I mean, I know my preaching isn't good, but is it really that bad? <laughs> and they're like, no, it's bad, but it's not what we don't go. <laughs> no, what they said was, uh, the people just weren't friendly. They just didn't accept us. I, I, I wrote it down so I could quote it to you, the words that they used uh, this is what they said. The people just aren't friendly. They didn't speak to us. We went downstairs for fellowship and we sat at a table by ourselves. No one invited us into for fellowship. We tried, but we just couldn't fit in. Now, immediately when they're telling me this, I'm getting defensive as a pastor, right? I'm thinking, I got the most friendly people in the whole world. Who are you? You don't, you know, like... You know how many people say how friendly we are as a church? And here you're telling me, you know, this doesn't make sense. But when it happens and it happens again, it happens again, I start saying, okay, there's some truth in this criticism here I need to listen to. Maybe there, we could do a better job of being kind, being friendly, being embracing as a church. And so this, this troubled me in my spirit, and I wanted to bring it to you as a church. And I want to ask you this morning, before you get defensive about your church and say, we are the friendliest church in the world, I want you to ask, ask yourself this question. It's number one, could I do better at embracing others? Number two, could I do a better job of making sure new people, 
people I don't know are included. Number three, what can I do to create a culture of kindness? And so when I say I want us to develop a culture of kindness at our church, let me spell that out for you and answer that question to you. Four things that we can do to create a culture of climate. Number one, understand that kindness is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering or forbearance, and kindness. Say it with me. Kindness. It's one of the fruits, one of the manifestations of the Spirit. In other words, if you're a child of God, kindness has to come out of you. It has to because he's in you. Jesus is in you. I know some people are kindlier or kinder or more charismatic. We're not talking about personalities here. I'm just talking about our attitude and our demeanor and the way that we approach people and the world with love and with kindness. God expects all of his children to exemplify kindness because we exemplify him. That's one thing we can do. Secondly, we can be intentional be intentional, intentional about seeking out people that you don't know. And this is hard for us, right? And most of you in this church, you come to church here and you've got friends here. You've got relationships here. And that's why you come to church here. It's not to hear Pastor Lane preach. It's not just to hear the music or the programs. It's relationships. It's always about relationships, right? I tell my staff this all the time. We can do the best job in the world, but if people don't develop relationships, they're not staying at our church. You can have the best children's ministry, you can have the best music, you can have the best preaching, but if people don't connect and feel a part of and develop relationships, they're going to go somewhere else because people are looking for relationships. They need that. We need that. That's the way God created us. And so you have your relationships and you have your friends and you look forward to coming to church on Sunday. And when you get to church, you look for them, you Zoom to them, you're sitting with them, you're talking with them, you're having coffee with them, you're eating an ungodly donut with them. You are, you know, you're socializing with them and that's wonderful. And I want you to do that, but just remember that there's somebody else that's sitting over here who's new to the church and they're looking for relationships, and they never had the opportunity because you haven't given it to them. So you got to include them. you got to look for them. Is there somebody here that's sitting alone? Nobody should ever sit alone downstairs. Nobody should ever be alone in the congregation. We should always be looking for people who are looking for God. People are looking for love. Listen, there's enough hate out there in the world. When they come to church, let them feel the love. Let them feel the love. Amen? Be intentional. Seek them out. Number three, take the risk of inviting somebody to your home. Inviting somebody into your group. Inviting somebody to your small group. Inviting somebody out for coffee. You say, well, yeah, I don't know them. I don't know anything about them. That's right. It's a risk. Take the risk. Somebody took a risk on you. And now you're their friend. Take a risk for somebody else. Number four, break the mold. Right? Say hi to people. Listen, we live in New England, right? In New England, you go down the sidewalk, if you're in a city, you go down the sidewalk and people go by, they don't make eye contact with you, they don't say hi, they don't even shake their heads. You just don't do that in New England, right? You just don't. You do if you're a child of God. As children of God, we break the mold. We're saying hi, hey, how you doing? Hi, how are you? Hey, hey. How you doing? You know, we're saying hi to everybody. We get, we're the people that get in the elevator. Have you ever gotten an elevator in Boston or in Hartford? And you get in the elevator, everybody sits there and they're like looking, they got their heads down. It's like complete silence. When I go to the hospital, it's like the elevator. I walk in there, there's people in there, and they're like quiet, you know, or they get their phone out, they start doing this. So you know what I do? I get in the elevator. I don't even turn around. I'm looking at them. How's everybody doing today? Having a good day? Right? 
Like, what floor are you going to? Let me help you. Let me push that button for you. Let me open that. Let me hold that door for you. We need to represent the kindness of our God who is kind to us, accepted us, and loved us. You say, well, that's not my personality. It may not be your personality, but it's your God. It's your God who lives inside of you. Be the initiator. Offer to help. Smile. Open the door for others. Pay for somebody's coffee. There's a thousand ways that you can show kindness. Rahab took the spies, treated them well, and hid them. Number five, understand that being kind doesn't cost you anything. And it reaps tremendous benefits. You have nothing to lose and you have everything to gain by being kind. Listen, just try it. Just try smiling at somebody. Just try saying hi to somebody. You'll be amazed at the response that people have for love. The reason why we are the way we are in New England is because this is a spiritually dark place. And you have what is needed to break those chains of darkness with the glorious light and love of Jesus and his gospel. And finally, look for opportunities. Look for opportunities to be Jesus in every single situation, whether you're at the gas station, whether you're at the grocery store, whether you're at work, you see somebody who needs help, you rush to help them. You be the good Samaritan. You be Jesus. You see somebody that's in pain, you go offer to pray for them. You see somebody that's been, been cussed out, you go encourage them and tell them to get a Q-tip. If you were here last week, you know what that meant, right? So I just wanted to say that about kindness. Now let's go back to Rahab's story. To really understand why she's in the Faith Hall of Fame was not just because she was kind. There's more to the story. So let's go to Joshua chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2. I'm reading from the NIV. Put this on the screen if you don't have a Bible. Now Joshua, this is a story of Joshua sending the spies in. So Joshua, the son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, hey, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent his mess this message to Rahab, quote, Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they have come to spy out the whole land, unquote. But the woman had taken the two spies and hid them. And she said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly and you may catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof to dry. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Before the, sky, the spies laid down for the night, Rahab went up on the roof and said to them, Listen, I know that the Lord, look at this, I know that the Lord, Yahweh, has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on all of us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard, we have heard, underline that, how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard it, our hearts melted in fear, and everyone's courage failed because of you. Underline this. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my family and mother and brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and that you will save us from death. The spies replied, 
our lives for your lives. The men assured her, if you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us this land. So she let them down, she let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. And she said to them, Go to the hills. That's the opposite direction of where she told the other two, the, the other soldiers to go. Go to the hills so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there three days until you return and then go on your way. Now the men had said to her, this oath you made us swear will not be binding on us unless when we enter the land you have tied the scarlet cord, underlined scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you have brought your father and mother, your brothers and your, all your family into your house, if any of them go outside your house into the street, their blood will be on their own heads and we will not be responsible. As for those who are in the house, underline that, those who are in the house, say it with me, those who are in the house with you, their blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on them. But if you tell what we are doing, we will be released from the oath that you made us swear. Agreed, she said. Let it be as you say. So she sent them away, and they departed. And the last sentence says, and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. Chapter 6, the walls of Jericho come down. Verse 25 says, but Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family. And here it is and all who belonged to her. Because she had hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho, and she lives among the Israelites to this day. Now, now we see why Rahab is a woman of great faith. To our knowledge, she never had an encounter with God. She never had a visitation from God. But what happened is she heard with her ears what God, the Israelite God, had done by taking the people out of Egypt, destroying Pharaoh's army, opening the Red Sea, bringing these people through the desert, how they slayed and completely destroyed the kings and the cities on the other side of the Jordan, and they were heading their way. And when she heard that, she believed that the God of Israel was real, and he was alive, and he was more powerful, and that her gods were powerless and not real. And so while the people around her were going to die in fear, she decided that she was going to choose the path of faith over fear and believe in the God of Israelites over the fear for the people, for the Canaanite gods. Rather than die in fear, she reached out to the one and only true God, confessed her faith in him. Amen. Confessed her faith in him. And believed in him. And I, I wrote in my notes, she reached out to God in hope, and God gave her a rope. Amen? God gave her a rope. Rahab went against everyone around her and sided with Yahweh over the demonic idols and the people of her past. She believed, and her faith was credited to her as righteousness. How do you know that? In James, the New Testament, chapter 2, and verse 25, it says this. In the same way, James 2, 25. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she had did when she gave lodging to the spies and set them off in a different direction? God says, I see your faith. I see your belief and you put it into action. You've confessed it and you're walking in it and she was saved. So let's look at the risks that Rahab took and then the rewards that she gained by taking these risks. Three risks that she took. Number one, the risk of allegiance, the risk of worship which God or God she was going to worship. She had been faithful to the Canaanite gods. They worship Baal, they worship Asherah, they worship Astarte, they worship Melech and sacrificed their children to him. She had been a part of this her whole life. 
and she had probably never heard of Yahweh until the Israelites showed up. But when she heard what God had done, she believed on the Lord and she was saved. How important it is, my friends, that you and I share our testimony, that you and I share our story. In Romans 10, Paul said, how are they going to hear unless you tell them? It's our job to preach, to proclaim, to share the story, the testimony of what God has done, how God has delivered me, how God has set me free, how God has changed my life. We must tell. Faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of the Lord. Her faith she received simply by hearing what God had done. How important it is that we speak. Number two. She took the risk of death. These spies were from the enemy's camp. And if the king found out that she was harboring these spies at will, that she was hiding them, no doubt he would have executed her probably on the spot. She had so much faith in Yahweh God, even though she had never met him, even though she had never been under a teaching. She believed in what had been manifested. She believed, and she believed to the point of risking her life for these spies that she had just met. That's why Rahab is in the faith hall of fame. Number three, she took the risk of hope her future, a new life. Now I realize I may be reading into the text a little here, but if you'll just indulge me, this isn't from the Lord, this is just Lane's thinking here. But when I look at this story, I have to believe in my heart that Rahab saw these spies in her house as a divine opportunity. As an opportunity for her not only to live, but to live a new life, to have a new chance, an opportunity for a clean slate. I mean, up to this point, I'm only saying what the text says. Rahab is known by the whole community, even the king, as the prostitute, as the one who ran the cat house at the city wall by the city gate. Her entire life to this point had been sullied. Either by choice or by chance, we don't know. But this is who she was. This is her identity. She was a prostitute. She was a harlot. And I, I have to think in my mind when those spies showed up from the great God Yahweh that she said to herself, perhaps with God, with the one and only true God, perhaps with the Israelites, if I side with them, I will have a new chance, a clean slate. She could be somebody that she always dreamed of being, not a prostitute. God put hope in her heart and she took it. And we're going to see in just a few minutes how that God gives Rahab a second chance. But I just want to stop here and say this. Don't you know that God will do the same thing for you? Some of you come and you can relate to Rahab because your life is no different than hers. Maybe you are a prostitute. Maybe you're in a sexual relationship of impurity. Maybe you come from drugs and alcohol and abuse. And maybe you come out of prison and people tag you and they said, you're a druggie, you're, you're a convict, you're an addict, you're a whatever. And people put their tags on you. But I want you to know this morning that if you will put your trust in the one and only true God, if you will believe in Jesus Christ, he will not only save you, he will give you a new slate, a clean slate, a new day. He'll wipe your sins away as far as the east is from the west, and he'll make you a new creation. That's what 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 says. For in Christ we are a new creation. The old is gone, and behold, all things are become new. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins from us. Psalm 103, verse 12. Amen? Amen. Jesus is our opportunity. She saw it. Saw it. With God, he gives us a new name. He gives us a new identity. So those are the three risks that she took. Now let's look at the results 
of Rahab's risk-taking. Number one, because she took risks, Rahab saved her family and herself. Chapter 6 to 25, we, we read it earlier, we'll read it again. Joshua spared Rahab, the prostitute, with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men. She saved her family and herself. Here we go. I'm feeling the anointing of the Holy Spirit right now, just all over me with this. Listen, the text that we read said, the spy said to her, whoever is in your house, when destruction comes, they will be saved. And the mark that will save them is the scarlet cord. That scarlet cord represents, it's a type of the blood of Jesus Christ. That when we apply the blood of Jesus Christ to our hearts and lives, when, just like in the Passover, they put the blood over the door, the mark of red, the scarlet blood, the destruction angel had to pass over. And he said, as long as you got the cord, whatever's in your house is going to be saved. Not just your mama, not just your daddy, not just your kids, whoever is in your house. I thought about this. I never really studied this before, but I just thought about it. And I thought, don't you know, she knew that just the day, the next day or the day after, they were going to come, they were going to destroy her city and everybody was going to die. Don't you know that Rahab spent the next 24 hours going everywhere she would, knocking on every friend's door? You got to be at my house tomorrow by 6 p.m. You got to come to my house. You got to get in my house. Mama, Dada, Cousin, uncle, aunt, friend, co-worker, you got to be in my house. I believe she told all the prostitutes in her inn, you got to be in my house tomorrow. Why? Because destruction is coming. And she didn't want anybody to get to die. She didn't want the people that she loved, the people that were in her life, to be destroyed with the sin and the judgment that's coming. Folks, don't you understand that the, G, the coming of Jesus Christ is right at our door? Destruction is coming. Judgment is coming to this world. And we don't have long. And we've got to get out of this building and get as many people as we can to come into this house. We've got to get them in the house because Jesus is in the house. Amen? And he's the only one that can save them. That's what's most important. That's this. That's this. This red wagon represents the souls of people that are all around you every day that are going to hell. And you're spending all your time and all your energy wasted on all these little distractions in your life. And you're thinking, oh, oh, well, what about, what about the election? Or, or what about the economy? Or what about the job? And what about these people and what they're doing? And we're gossiping. And we get up at all this and all the time. There's people, there's people dying and going to hell all around us. And the devil has got our eyes looking elsewhere. We've got to focus on the harvest people. I'm telling you, our time is short. The main thing is winning souls. How are you going to feel with the walls? You say, well, I've got to make money. I've got to get prepared. I've got to have my house. I've got to get this. I've got to do that. I've got my career. I've got this. I've got all these things. Guess what? None of those things are going to matter when the walls come crashing down. What is your money going to matter when the walls come crashing down? What does it matter what, your, what people think about you? Did you get that promotion? Did you, did you do this? Did you, did you reach that goal? It's not going to matter when everything is burning. What's going to matter is, are you in the house? <laughs> Have you been brought into protection? We're building an ark here. You know, I want to, I, I don't know about you, I want a bigger house because we got to get, we got to fill this house, folks. 
The blood of Jesus is over this place. We have the anointing of God on us here at Lighthouse Church. We have a calling to reach lost people all around us. That's why we're called the Lighthouse. We're sending out the signal. Come, come. The winds and waves, this is the way to safety. This is the way to salvation. This is the way to salvation. Mm. We got to keep our focus on that red wagon. Amen? Rahab was, I believe she was, it doesn't say it in the text, I believe she was making sure everybody was in her house. How many, ask you a question this morning, how many people can you fit into your house? How many people can you fit into your house? Go out and get them. Number two, Rahab found the one and true God. That was a consequence of her risk. She discovered that Yahweh was real, <laughs> that he was alive. She got to see the glory of God. Number three, Rahab found a new life. She found a better life. The Bible says, as we go into her story, that she married an Israelite man. She had children. She had a family. She had, a, she had the life that she always dreamed that she couldn't have as a prostitute. Now get, God gives her a new life here on the earth. But number four, listen to this. This is going to blow you away. Rahab actually... Rahab the prostitute, Rahab the harlot, actually becomes the great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus Christ. I'm going to show you a scripture that's going to blow you away. Maybe you've never seen this before. It's in Matthew chapter 1, the beginning of the gospel, the beginning of the New Testament, the first verses in the New Testament telling us about Jesus Christ, and it begins with the lineage of of Jesus showing how Jesus descended from the line of David, which is the fulfillment of many Old Testament prophecies that the Messiah must come from the light, from the tribe of Judah, from the lineage of David the king. One will come. A root from the stem of Jesse will spring forth and he will save the whole world. Jesus Christ. And so the writer Matthew very painstakingly goes to detail to give the lineage to show that Jesus Christ, son of Mary and God Almighty and Joseph, right, that he was from directly descended from this lineage. And look at verse 5. Solomon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was who? Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of David. Right there in the lineage of Jesus Christ is Rahab. Rahab the harlot. Rahab the prostitute. Rahab the Gentile. Rahab the Hishanamosi. Rahab the heathen. And if God could use a prostitute to bring salvation to the world. He can use you. He can use me. I don't care what your past is. I don't know where you come from. But God wants to use you. He really does. And he wants to use you to build an ark to save people. He has a plan for your life. Rahab becomes a savior. Number five, she becomes a savior and a type of Christ. Look at this. Because of her faith, she saved her family. She saved the spies. She saved the Israelites, their invasion. She has a part in saving the whole world through the lineage of Jesus. And she also represents the Gentiles. She's the Gentile that was grafted in, showing us that from the very beginning, God's plan was not for this to be a Jewish thing. That God died for all people, red, yellow, black, and white, Jew and Gentile, heathen and saint. He died for all of us, and all of us are equal in his sight, and he had a plan from the very beginning. God can change the world through those who take risks. I want the ushers to prepare. We're going to have uh, communion in just a minute together. 
And maybe someone could come and play on the keys. What can we learn from Rahab about taking risks? Number one, taking risks is part of our salvation experience. It's a part of our spiritual growth. You will never grow in your relationship with Christ without taking risks. You will never grow in your finances unless you're willing to take risks. You'll never grow in your job and career unless you're willing to take risks. You'll never grow in friendships and relationships unless you're willing to take risks. Risk-taking is critical. It's a part of our whole salvation process. Secondly, some things are worth dying for. Amen? Some things are worth dying for. And you know what's worth dying for? <laughs> Not a box. The stuff that the world puts in this box is just dust. It's going to burn. It's going to turn to ash. It means nothing. But what's done for Christ, the songwriter said, that will last that will last. What is your priority today? What's in your wagon? <clears throat> Stand with me across the room. The wagon represents souls, lost people, dying people who need Jesus. What are you focusing on? Now, I want you to stop for a minute. I want to ask you, those of you online, if you're driving, don't do this, but if you're not driving, if you're here in the room, I want you to close your eyes. I want you to ask the Lord this morning. This is a message for the church today. I want you to ask the Lord this morning. Who can I get in my house? Who can I reach who can I invite? Who can I try to persuade? You can't save anybody. You can't make them come into your house. But you've got to invite them. You've got to tell them about Jesus. You've got to tell them the story. God did this, and he'll do this for you. He's doing this for me. He'll do this for you. Father, who, who, who in my house? Who, who can I get into my house? Who can I invite into my house? Who can, who, whose life can I make a difference today, Lord? Because let me tell you something. The soldiers of the Lord are saddling their horses. Jesus is getting on that white horse, and he is ready to ride. And he's coming this second time, not to die, but to destroy death, to destroy sin, to judge in righteousness and truth, and to make everything right. The walls are coming down that men have built, and only what we build for Christ will last. All the walls of Jericho fell down except for the one spot where Rahab's house was. It was because of the scarlet cord, the blood of Christ had been applied there. Is your house covered in the blood of Jesus? So Father, I pray that you would show us this morning. Show us today, Lord. Show us. Now, this morning as we partake of Holy Communion, we have the bread and we have the cup. The bread representing the body of our Lord Jesus Christ that was broken for us. The blood representing, the, the cup representing the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for us. And what is in my hand here, for those watching online, this is proof that God loves you. And this is proof that he's coming back. <laughs> he said, if I go not away... The comforter cannot come unto you. But he said, I am going away, and I will come again and receive you unto myself. 
So Jesus is coming back and he proved it by dying and rising from the dead. And we remember the price that he paid for our salvation. But folks, this is not only for our salvation. It's for the salvation of the whole world. And there are lost people that we need to remember in this meal. In this meal, we are to remember Jesus. It's all about him and the price that he paid, but it also should help us know that there are people who are hungry and thirsty, who have not partaken, who have not tasted the Lord and seen that he is good. There are those who are not ready, who need this cup. They need the blood of Jesus applied to their life. They need the scarlet cord. And so today, not only do we remember Christ and his work on Calvary in this meal, but let's remember the loss that he died for. Let's be grateful and thank God that he found us (laughs) and he ordained us and he chose us. And let's be thankful and grateful and let's honor him and praise him and worship him in this meal. But let's also in this meal think of others others who have not come to the table yet and let's bring him to the table you don't you don't have to be a member of our church to partake if you're a christian if you're a believer in jesus we invite you to join us in this meal in this section if you'll just come these two sections to your left down this aisle and receive from this station and return to your chairs this way if you'll come please this section here if you'll come to your left and receive at this station right here and return to your chairs this way. This station to your left, please. Receive from this section, receive from this station and return to your chairs that way. This section, if you'll come to your left and receive from this station and return to your chairs this way, if you'll come at this time. These two sections, if you'll come to your left and receive from this station here and return to your chairs this way. Please hold the elements until everybody has been served. And when everybody has been served, we will all partake together at the same time. Those of you watching online, grab the crackers, grab the grape juice, the wine, whatever it is you have, and take this moment, gather your family, your friends together, and we'll partake together. Take this moment and gather your elements. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. We sang the song earlier, worthy. He is worthy of all the praise we give him. This is why he's worthy, because he alone was able to give his life for us. He was the spotless lamb. His blood was not the blood of bulls and goats. It was heavenly blood. It was pure blood. It was sinless, spotless lamb that was led to the slaughter for us. We remember, we remember today. We remember. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Just hold the elements in your chair. Just wait on everybody to be served. Just close your eyes and just meditate on the cross. Meditate on Jesus and his love for you how much he loves you, that he gave his life, that he suffered, his body was broken for you, his blood was spilled for you. Think on him, meditate on him, dwell on him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for what you've done for me, Lord. We praise you today, Jesus. We thank you, Lord God Almighty. We thank you, Lord God Almighty. We praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. You have come to us, Lord. You have come to us. Father, we thank you today. Father, we praise you today. Thank you, Father, for sending your son, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for willingly submitting yourself to the will of the Father, 
humbling yourself, taking on flesh and bone for us, becoming one of us so that you could pay this price for us. We are humbled today. We are grateful today. We remember today what you have done for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you for waiting. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Father, today. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father God. Amen. Will you lift up the bread of our Lord? In Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul writes instructions for this meal, and he says that, in the same night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. As often as you eat it, you do remember my death until I come again. Father, we thank you for your body that was torn, beaten, bruised, pierced for us. You were broken so that we could be put back together. You were broken so that we could be healed. And by your stripes, we receive our healing today. We bless this, your body, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may partake. If you raise the cup. After supper, he took the cup and he raised it. He blessed it, saying, This is my blood, which is shed for you. A new covenant I am making with you. Jesus, we thank you for the new covenant. We thank you that we are no longer under the law, but you fulfilled that law. And this is the ultimate consummation of it that you were the sacrifice once and for all offered up for the sins of mankind. Your blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And we bless this, your cup, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may partake. Hallelujah. Now let's just thank you. Just lift your hands and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you have made me worthy today to receive only by the grace of God. Thank you for your love and acceptance with all my faults, all my sins, all my problems, all my troubles, all my hurts and hang-ups today, God. That you have looked past all of that and you have washed me clean and you've given me a new chance. Now, Lord, help me to Invite others into this fellowship, into this grace, into this covenant that you have made. That they too would experience the life, the eternal life of Jesus. The Zoe life of Christ. That they would be transformed and born again and given a new name. Father, as we leave this building today, let us go forth as your ambassadors. Let us understand that our time is short and not be distracted by the little boxes or the little foxes to keep our minds and our thoughts and our energies on what is the most important and that is preaching, proclaiming, and living the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world and bringing them into our house. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Love one another. Hey, be kind to one another. Get to know one another. Join us downstairs for coffee, and God bless you in your holiday weekend. Thank you so much for watching online today. Love one another.